Putting up to it's important we look at the facts. Yeah. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Paul Hutchin, political editor of The Daily Record, and welcome to the latest Planet Holyrood. Joining me this week are Hannah Roger, chief reporter of the Sunday Mail, and Douglas Dickey of the Scottish Daily Express. Now, at long last, we're in the final stretch of the SNP leadership campaign, which feels like it's gone on for decades. We get the result on Monday, and then the fun begins. We get a new SNP leader on that day, and then we'll get a new First Minister, I think, on Tuesday, and then a new Cabinet. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that if Hamza Youssef wins, the question will be how he can unite this divided party. If Kate Forbes wins, what sort of Cabinet will she be able to put uh, together? And if Ash Regan wins, I think it's, oh my God. So let's just start with you, Hannah. You know, in terms of the, the last few days of the campaign, you know, if you, if you focus on the first couple of weeks, it was all about um, attacks between Hamza Youssef, um, Kate Forbes and Ash Regan. But then it sort of changed to the way that the party was being governed um, based on a scandal on membership figures. Could you just talk us through that and the Sunday Mail's pivotal role in the story? Yeah, so um, I think, you know, as you said, the start of the campaign was very different. We were looking at, you know, Kate Forbes' religious views and why Hamza may or may not have voted on equal marriage. And that now kind of pales in comparison to what has ended up happening, which is, you know, some, some people have described this as a sort of bubble story, but actually it's much more important than that. So the Sunday Mail, my colleague John Ferguson, he had a, um, a tip that the SNP had lost 30,000 members in a two-year period. Um, and, you know, he spoke to various people about it, backed up. The, the tip and then he went to the SNP as any kind of good journalist would and say you know we've got this information what would you like to comment what's your response and there was a very odd response in that um, they kind of dismissed our claims and then they said something about there had been a loss of 300 members but 300 had joined you know, so therefore there was no change in the membership and it was all very strange. And then um, there was a story that, you know, you could say had been planted um, in a uh, independent supporting rival newspaper, basically rubbishing our, our story. Um, the head of communications, Murray Foote, personally went on Twitter and called our original story drivel. It was all very unpleasant and a bit sort of, you know, in, incestuous in terms of, of journalism. But then, because of the uh, the leadership campaign, obviously the candidates were interested to know well how many of the S how many members does the SNP have, because we want to be able to see, you know, how many people are actually engaging in this vote, um, and therefore there was pressure on SNP HQ to publish the membership figures. And lo and behold, we find out that indeed. John Ferguson was 100% correct. The membership has declined by about 32,000 in, in that period. So therefore, it is questions about why they had essentially lied, why they had said to our initial inquiries that, you know, this hadn't happened. So, you know, that that's the sort of gist of it. And it raised bigger questions about, you know, why why the media was misled, why, you know, what, what the purpose of this was and the sort of overall governance of the party, who misled who, um, are decisions being taken by a small clique, as some people have called it, rather than um, by the wider party. And so it's kind of opened up the SNP in that way that we haven't really seen before. So, I mean, to cut a long story short, Hannah, I mean, Murray Foote resigned as, I think, head of comms of the SNP group, and then Peter Murrow resigned as chief executive. He also happens to be Nicola Sturgeon's uh, husband. 
been, <clears throat> what, what is your theory on why the Sunday Mail was told a lie? Um, I mean, someone said to me recently, well, you know, there's no point in, in asking why the SNP didn't confirm these details. Of course, they're not going to want this to come out. You know, the head of comms, that's their job to sort of disguise bad news. And I was like, well, there's a difference between disguising and, and actively, you know, lying about it. Um, and to be honest, Paul, I don't know. I I don't have a theory as to why exactly they did that. I think it just points to a sort of wider culture. And I mean, you guys, I'd be interested to hear your views as well, but this wider culture that seems to have kind of perpetrated within the SNP and other political parties, but in my experience anyway, particularly the SNP of, you know, dismissing things that may not be favourable towards them, um, even if that means being sort of liberal with the truth, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, my experience is that it's slightly easier getting a straighter response from the Scottish government than it is from the SNP as a party, probably because the Scottish government is a public body paid for by taxpayers' money, whereas the SNP is like a political party and you know, they probably feel like they don't have to answer questions, but um, blown up in their faces. Um, Doogie, I mean, how is this whole row, which has led to, as I say, the resignation of Peter Murrow, changed the dynamic of the leadership campaign? Well, it's immediately kind of called into question those at the very top of the party, those who are obviously organising this vote, Peter Murrow, as chief executive. Um, it's kind of overseeing the entire thing. And I guess, I guess the question is, uh, if we can't trust them on something as 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 simple as, you know, how many members do you have? How, how, how can we trust them on anything else? And obviously this feeds into these conspiracy theories, um, mainly coming from the Ash Reagan camp, about uh, the, the contest is rigged in favour of Humza Yusuf. Um, I... I don't think it's rigged, but I think at the same time the SNP have all got themselves to blame for these kind of conspiracy theories because they kind of feed on them. And I think it's interesting, you know, what Hannah said about why why the SNP done this. It, 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 it's kind of allowed them by by not being truthful about the numbers and Sunday Mail has printed a perfectly accurate um, article. It's allowed them to go on the offensive against the big bag, uh, you know, the big bad media again. But it, 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 it certainly raises massive questions over you know Peter Murrow and 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 his ability to um be uh, his say uh, truthful but um you know definitely cast uh, questions on the whole process because uh, as I say if we can't get a straight answer to this how are we expecting a straight answer to anything uh, our own experience with um the SNP is uh, I, I'm sure you can imagine it's um, a bit difficult. Um, they don't often engage uh, with myself. They've been a wee bit better this week, actually. I, I don't know if that's a change of uh, boss at the top, but um, uh, you know, the SNP is shrouded in secrecy um, I, I, and this kind of cabal at the top that want to kind of hoard power. And I think I think this feeds into that narrative, even, even if that narrative isn't correct. It, it, it's given people on or, you know, on the fringes, such as uh, Ash Reagan supporters, to kind of call the whole process into question. Dougie, I mean, obviously it's a three-horse race, but we know that only two candidates can win this, Hamza Yousaf and Kate Forbes. We're on the last lap. We're on the Thursday, a few days before polls close. Which candidate do you think will be happiest with where they are just now? I think... Um, I think Humza Yusuf will be happy. Hum, uh, Humza Yusuf is going to be the next First Minister, in my opinion, um, for better or worse. Um, so I think... I think I'm sure of that. That. Why are you so sure about that? Because I think, I believe, I think I said the last time I was on, I think what SNP members want is they don't necessarily want someone who's going to be good at government. They want a kind of focal point, someone they can, they can 
you know, kind of rallied behind the independence cause. And I think that Kate Forbes, even though it was very early in the uh, process, I think has, has, you know, damaged herself with her comments on single-sex marriage and whatnot. Uh, and, and I think a lot of SNP supporters don't then see her as the progressive beacon that they can get behind. Um, I think I'll talk, the entire the entire campaign has been about who is SNP leader. There's been very, very little about, you know, the, the, the fact that whoever comes in is going to be first minister. Cost of living crisis, the NHS have, have been largely ignored by the candidates um, in favour of talking, you know, over the Scottish public directly to um, their members. And I, I, and I think Humza Yusuf will have uh, connected more with your average SNP member, even even though Kate Forbes is probably a more competent character. Um, and as you say, I think we can I think we can safely discount. Ash Reagan. So what 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 of course complicates matters is that um it's it, it, it's not a simple first past the post vote. Um Ash Reagan Ash, Ash Reagan's second votes may yet uh, prove prove decisive. And you know, there's a new poll out today that suggests that Humza Yusuf remains really unpopular with the Scottish public. Uh less Far, uh, far less, uh, more unpopular, I would say, than Kate Forbes, who's also not very popular. And he's lead within the SNP, um, within SNP members. I don't think he's as big as I thought it would be, but I, I, I just can't see, I can't see passing. I'm a great believer, Paul, Paul, the bookies never get it wrong, and the bookies um, are rarely get it wrong, uh, sadly for me. And uh, I, think, uh, I think in this case, you'll get it right. Um, Hannah uh, Doogie thinks it's going to be Humza. Do you agree? Um, I mean, I, yes and no. I think that <clears throat> Humza thinks it's going to be Humza. Uh, most people do think it's going to be Humza. I think it could potentially still be Kate Forbes, and we've said this repeatedly, but the SNP membership is is untested, so it's still not entirely clear what their uh, overall views are. And I think as well, this contest has been interesting because, you know, under Nicola Sturgeon, there really has been this push to present the SNP and therefore kind of Scotland as the SNP is the governing party of Scotland as this sort of progressive kind of um, open... Uh, place and the SNP is an extension of that but what we've seen in this contest is there is actually such a wide variety of views and beliefs and opinions and I don't actually think that's been a negative thing but also it's maybe made a few people rethink their views of the SNP as a whole when you've got those three candidates who you know you can argue they've got their from all kind of spectrum of the party. So it's quite a good kind of cross section um, for people to see the sort of spread of views, I guess. But I don't know in terms of who's going to win. Yeah, it's between Hamza and, and Kate, but I don't know. I've seen so many times where you think something's a dead set and then it actually ends up not being that. So I don't know. Let's move on. Um... Today at Holyrood, we had Nicola Sturgeon's final statement at Holyrood as First Minister um, following her resignation. I, I would imagine there's going to be a debate raging on her legacy, um, given that she's the longest serving First Minister, the first female First Minister. Um, Hannah, she would probably say that she leaves behind a progressive legacy. Her critics will say it's, what, seven, eight wasted years. What's your take on it? Um, I think that, you know, it's quite hard to point to a, a single um, legacy point for Nicola Sturgeon. I think, you know, we can all agree things like the baby box and, and other kind of the Scottish child payment, they've been like really good. Um, and I don't think that many people would argue against those. But when you balance it out with, you know, the the 
the things that haven't been achieved, for example, you know, the ferries, for example, um, we've got new poverty figures out today that are not that positive. Um, we've got NHS in crisis. We've got the A9 still hasn't been dual. You know, there's all these massive projects that really could and should be done to be making the lives of the average person in Scotland better. And unfortunately, under Nicola Sturgeon, they haven't been done. So, yeah, I think, is that fair to say? Would you guys agree? I'm not, I don't want to be too harsh. I mean, I do think, you know, she's, you know, she's definitely a very talented politician. She has achieved some some good things, but I think there's a lot of stuff that just hasn't been done. That, that yeah, she, I mean, she, she's a politician of the centre left, so you know, if you judge her on those standards, you know, Scottish child payment, that's a 25 quid a week payment to low-income families. Um, you know, she's expanded free childcare, there's the baby box. Is that not a positive legacy for her? I think um, it's interesting you, you bring up the baby box, Paul, um, because to me that kind of typifies Sturgeon. It, it, you know, it's a perfectly nice thing to do and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that it's not, but it, it, it doesn't deal with the root of the problems that she herself identified at the start of her, um, you know, of her, of her tenure. It's just, it's just free stuff quite often to people who don't, you know, who don't need it. And I, I was absolutely, to be honest, I was absolutely aghast at her comment on Lost Women the other day when she said that um, it, it, it means that literally every child in Scotland has has, has the exact same start. I mean, I, I, I think you should, you know, try telling that to the people to 24% of kids who are living in poverty, the same as when she took over, to people, you know, drug deaths through the roof, do these families have the same start? I, I thought it was an absolutely nonsense statement, to be honest. Obviously, you know, I think Scotch Daily Express readers will see her legacy as one of division, uh, no attempt to kind of heal the wounds of 2014. And if anything, she's tried to uh, continue to, uh, you know, drive a wedge between two op opposing parts of Scotland. Um, you know, she said, judge me on education. Doesn't look good. Uh, the deprivation gap's not come down. She, she, she has, what I will say is obviously she's um, been leader through unprecedented times with COVID. Um, but I think, again, she she used COVID to her advantage. She simply presented herself as a bit different from down south when actually uh, the paths we followed were almost identical. Um, and she's... Um, I think she leaves with a legacy of failure. Ultimately, her goal was to break up the UK, and she leaves, and it, that 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 dream looks even further away than it did when you know when she took over. And you've even got guys like Pete Wisher and Ben uh, and Ben McPherson alluding to that. And her, uh, as always, as well, her legacy is going to be you know whoever takes over. So you know, Humza Yusuf. It's like if you ordered Nicola Sturgeon on Wish, and you know, or Kate Forbes, who has got, I think we can only say really, you know, questionable views on certain social issues. Certainly, in my opinion, so uh, I don't think her uh, legacy will be anything to write home about. But I guess I, I always, uh, sometimes the legacy isn't written for a few years. So um, uh, I think we'll maybe need to wait and see where we are in a year time. Uh, a year's time to see the true legacy of, of, of the Sturgeon era. Um, Hannah, just, just on independence, now clearly that's her driving force, that's what she wanted most of all. So if, you, if you're if you an independent supporter, didn't she fail on that? I mean, she failed to get a referendum, therefore she failed to get independence. And it doesn't seem like she made the breakthrough that people thought she might after 2014. Um. <clears throat> So I think, right, I'm going to come back to you on the independence thing, but I do, I, I kind of feel as if saying that Sturgeon had a, is a legacy of failure, full stop, <clears throat> sorry, is, is a little bit harsh. Like, I, you know, I think she has achieved, as I've said, she has achieved some good things, but also overall, right, you've got to look at her as... <sighs> 
a female politician. She's done a lot in terms of equality in the parliament and, and all that sort of thing. I think she's she's probably inspired quite a lot of women to sort of, I guess, maybe challenge themselves or think about going into politics. So there's all that sort of legacy stuff as well that you have to think about that's not just like, you know, but I do understand that there's issues with, as I've said, significant things like health, education, etc. But I just think it's a bit unfair to say she's got a legacy of failure full stop because that, you know, she is one of Scotland's best politicians of the last, like, several decades, I would say. So I think that's a little bit unfair. Um, but, Paul, in terms of your point about independence, sorry, what can you remind me of? Yeah, if you look at it from the, the perspective of <laughs> independent supporter has she not failed on independence and she didn't get in direct to therefore independence hasn't been delivered and has she really moved the dial on independence at all because it, the polls go up like a yo-yo she never really seemed to make that sort of um substantive lasting change um, yeah. that should independence be the, the same will in scottish people um, I would say on independence, that's a tricky one. Certainly the polls do not show any significant change in terms of support for independence or not. Um, as you say, they, they fluctuate on a sort of daily, monthly basis. And it's now, you know, I'm now starting to question, well, how valuable really are these polls in terms of being used to inform like SNP strategy because they do change so often. Um, but, you know, she has advanced, I suppose, the, the, she sort of explored the options for independence. I mean, in terms of the Supreme Court case, for example, we know now that that doesn't seem to be a possibility. So therefore, for the next SNP leader or the next person who wants to pursue independence, they're going to have to think of something else. Um, and I would say she has successfully, or yeah, I'd say she has pretty successfully, as Dewey was saying, put a sort of distance between the Scottish and UK governments in a way that, you know, whether you agree with it or not, she has kind of definitely highlighted the 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 sort of divide there, and she has kind of very obviously tried to make out that that the Scottish government's doing things differently, and Scotland could kind of, you know, do things better on its own. Whether you agree with that or not is is a separate issue, but she certainly kind of highlighted those differences and maybe that's all part of the strategy to make people reconsider their views but certainly right now you know the, as you say the polls don't reflect any sort of massive shift towards independence right let's just turn briefly to events from yesterday in the aftermath the party gate hearings at westminster basically boris johnson in front of the privileges committee um i don't need to massively go over old ground but um, we know that uh, Boris uh, got into a, a massive mess over lockdown era parties and gatherings in Downing Street where everyone else was um, obeying the rules. So Dougie, just you know, very bluntly, is he a massive liar or is he a guy who just caught short? Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak personally here. Um, I think he's a massive liar. Why do you think that? Because I think he must have known that um, that these uh, events were breaking rules. I mean, the idea that he would, you know, have stood up um, in one of these press conferences and said, uh, you know, a workplace wants to have some leaving drinks for someone, uh, would we... Um, would we be able to do that? And he's he's claiming yesterday that he would say, oh, it's up to each individual place. I mean, he was asked these questions at the time. Should you have Christmas parties, for example? No. Um, there was a letter, a, a boy, uh, a young boy sent to him asking if he could have a birthday party. No. But Boris was able to have a birthday party. I, I, I think it's... Um, uh, an outrage. I realise this might not be the answer. You, you know, <laughs> you, 
you were kind of expecting. Doogie, his birthday party was essential for work purposes. Of course, of course, yes, yeah. yeah. Right. And to be honest, I I don't get through a day at work without about four bottles of wine in front of me, Anna. So, well, um, and of like, course, a Union Jack cake in yeah, in a Tupperware yeah. box. We've all got that lined up every day to eat during the work. Me in the fridge right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, yeah. no, I think I I I I think he must he he must have known. He must have known. So, yeah. Hannah, I take it from your sarcastic response that you don't believe that Boris is the victim of a vast left-wing conspiracy, no? Me? Sarcastic? Never. Um, no, of course not. I don't believe that Boris, <laughs> Boris is the victim of a left-wing conspiracy. I think that it's pretty obvious that he was telling porky pies um, and he's been caught out. I mean, we can see that. We can see it in the emails uh, from his comms, between his comms, team kind of debating on how they should best present, you know, a response to journalists who were asking about this. Uh, we can see from his, quite frankly, bizarre and uncomfortable uh, and and pretty aggressive at times uh, appearance yesterday at the Privileges Committee. He didn't, you know, he just repeated himself. He kept saying it was, he thought, you know, I just felt like it was some sort of psychological experiment, that whole appearance, you know. He was trying to say, basically, how do you know what was going on inside my mind and the information I had in my mind? You will never be able to know that, so therefore you have to find me not guilty. I mean, it's just, it was it was just bizarre. It was bizarre. Um, so, yeah, I, yeah. Think he was telling Porky Pies, I'm afraid. And even if he wasn't, and he, you know, even if he wasn't, and he did genuinely, for you know, in whatever realm of fantasy he exists in, think that he was obeying the rules, like then he's an idiot. He's an absolute idiot. So you know, you're either an idiot or a liar or possibly both. So then, well, Boris Johnson is a, a massive liar. You heard it here first. Yep. Hold okay, the front page. Let's just move on then to Tweet of the Week. Dougie, what's yours? So I've picked uh, this from uh, Councillor Mary McMurty, <laughs> SMP, uh, welcoming um, their 5,000 new members who joined in the aftermath of Peter, of Peter Murrell's departure um, last week. Uh, the reason I picked pick this is because uh, there is no Councillor Mary McMurty. This is one of the many. Um, parody SNP accounts about, but this one in particular managed to uh, catch out a couple of um, SNP politicians, Chris Hall and Joe Fitzpatrick, both liked this tweet, and I think that uh, goes to show that even SNP parody and you know SNP parody and SNP reality are so close to one another that it uh, becomes really hard to see the difference between the pair of them, and that uh, certainly gave me a wee chuckle. Oh, that is quite a good tweet, though. It does look... I mean, if I saw that, I wouldn't think that it was false. She'd done some other ones that uh, you would know. You know, mm -hmm. for example, uh, one was... Uh, we all know who we are backing in the leadership bid, and it was a picture of Peter Murrow, but it had been done up as if it was an actual leadership. Yeah. Leadership. So, mm -hmm. uh, maybe maybe a wee lesson to all of us to check, to check the account before... We start liking and retweeting. Yeah, I, mean, I do love these spoof accounts. I particularly like it when politicians get taken in by them. Um, how about you, Hannah? What's your tweet of the week? Well, I I have been a bit of a um, a nerd and not gone for something very funny, but this came out um, this morning, and I thought, you know, even even though she's leaving, Nicola Sturgeon has still got. You know, the only net positive popularity rating of all the, the leaders of kind of, well, poor old Bart Drakeford is not there, but the ones that we would know anyway. Um, I just think that's astonishing. I really do. And also the fact that it's gone up even since uh, early February. So even with all of this chaos that's been going on, um, you know, it, Nicola Sturgeon's still extremely popular, whereas a uh, good old Douglas Ross has got minus thirty nine or something or something. So, but the interesting thing about that as well is, um, uh, 
Anas Sarwar, he's, I mean, he's still got a negative uh, rating, but it's it's not too bad. I think it's like minus four or something like that. So, you know, that's that's There's also, there's also a, a, a lot of people who don't have any opinion on Anas Sarwar. Mm. Which, um, I, I don't think Bode's great for him. I think maybe they'll surely a wee bit of, uh, well, she's leaving, so we'll be nice to her and say we've got a, a, a positive view of her. I think that, you know, regardless of what you think of the going first minister, the SNP will miss her as a party. You know, she, yeah. she kept those divisions together for so long, kind of fell apart in the last few months. But, um, you know, in terms of her standing as the figurehead of the SNP, um, she's going to be a hard act to follow. Um, um, in terms of the final bit of the programme, let's have a look at good week, bad week. Hannah, who have you got? So my good week is uh, just a bit of a personal plug, the Sunday Mail, um, which, you know, extends to basically journalists. It's been a pretty good week for journalists in terms of, you know, showing that actually we can hold power to account, we can um, persevere and ultimately the truth will come out. And I think that, you know, that was shown by, by John Ferguson's diligent reporting. But I think, you know, it was also, it gave a platform to a lot of other journalists to sort of air their concerns and grievances about, um, you know, public communications and the level of spin and, and misleading that goes on. And I think it's been it's been pretty healthy for, for everyone, a lesson for perhaps some senior comms people within these organisations to to really think twice about what they're saying to people when they're they're asked questions. So yeah, that's my it's been a brilliant it's been a brilliant week for the Sunday Mail. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Who's on the naughty step for you? Uh, my naughty step is of course Boris Johnson. It's not been a good week for Boris. He's very cross. He thinks everyone's out to get him. And to be fair, I'd, I'd say most people probably are because, as we have pointed out, he's been telling porcupines. I think that's self-explanatory. Doogie, who's up? Who's down? Uh, so it's been a good week, I think, for um, Bernard Jenkins and the other members of, of mm-hmm. the uh, uh, the committee looking into Boris. I think they've um, shown that they have approached it without fear or favour. I also think it would be a real lesson to our Holyrood committees, which are frequently um, delve into kind of party political, especially the one I, I was thinking back to the Scottish Government Committee, sorry, the Scottish Government response to the sexual harassment uh, claims committee a few years ago when the SNP members were bending over backwards to try and protect Nicola Sturgeon. Mm. Uh, and I think you've seen yesterday how, how it should be done. Um, I, I'd also just like to say as well, uh, Hannah, I thought the Sunday Mail uh, coverage on Sunday was absolutely fantastic. So I think it was also a great week for the Sunday Mail. Thank and, you. And um, on the on the naughty step is uh, it's got to be Peter Murrow, who has lost his iron grip, or at least part. Uh, it was uh, you know he'd one iron grip on it, and Nicholas Sturgeon had the other. Um, he's been obviously ousted from his job. He's facing questions over this. Uh, missing uh, six hundred thousand pounds, and now his 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 partner is embarking on a new media tour. Uh, so I don't think she's going to be home much uh, over the next few months, uh, especially if she takes up the offer of um, wash women. So it might be the microwavable meals for one for the foreseeable for Peter. So uh, <laughs> I think it's been a bad week for him. Listen, that's great. Um, thanks again to Hannah and Douglas for their commentary and insight. Um, the next time we broadcast Planet Hollywood, we should have a new SNP leader and a new First Minister of Scotland and a new cabinet. So no doubt there'll be plenty to discuss. And please join us again next week. It's important we look at the facts. Why? Why? Douglas Ross is sounding pretty scared. I believe in independence. And he clapped like a seal.